So I want to draw attention there to the last verse where it says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 25, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. So we see, first of all, that before man falls into sin, before man eats of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that he is not ashamed of the fact that he is naked. He is naked in the presence of uh, not only his wife, but also the Lord God. You know, he would walk daily with the Lord of what we see in Scripture, and this was not something that he was ashamed of at that time. He didn't even know. Man was innocent. He was unashamed in his nakedness because of the fact that anything else was just simply unknown. There was no sin. They didn't understand what naked even meant. It was just the way they were. But, of course, we know the story in Genesis chapter 3 that the woman eats of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, where after she's tempted by the devil, she gives to her husband who's with her, and, and they eat, and they're both of their eyes are opened, and in this sinful state, man becomes aware of the fact, first of all, the first thing he notices, it seems, is the fact that he is naked. And this results, of course, in him feeling shame for the first time, the fact that he is naked and not clothed. It says in verse 8, go to verse 7, it says, And the eyes of both of them were opened, and they, made, and they knew that they were naked. So that's one of the first things that happens after they eat of this fruit. They realize that they are naked. And it says, And they sewed fig, fig leaves together and made themselves aprons, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, where, where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? So one of the verse things that happens when they fall is the fact that they understand that they are naked, and that nakedness, that knowing that they're naked, brings a sense of shame to them, which is good, which is right, which is something that needs to take place, quite frankly, with more people today. And we'll talk a little about that in, 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 when we get into it. But let me just start out by saying that, you know, nakedness is a shameful thing. You know, being naked is not something we should, we should, uh, we should desire to do uh, besides any, in front of anybody besides our spouse. You know, and it's a natural reaction to feel naked. Everyone's probably had, you know, that horrific dream where they go somewhere public and everyone's laughing or whatever and then they realize in their dream that they're not wearing any clothes and they startle awake and go, <gasps> it was just a dream and there's you know, a big sigh of relief, right? But that's a natural reaction to feel shame when we're naked. <coughs> it's something to be ashamed of. If you would, go over to Revelation chapter 3, Revelation chapter 3. I'll read to you from Revelation chapter 16. The Bible says, Behold, I come as a thief, Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Now, I believe there's a, he's speaking spiritually here. He's not talking about a literal nakedness. But notice, again, that nakedness and shame go hand in hand. That when a person is naked, it is natural, it is right to f for them to feel ashamed. That's the way we should react. Look at Revelation, chap Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. It says, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, write these things, saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Again, he's making spiritual application here. I counsel thee to buy gold of me tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. And I want to preach tonight a sermon entitled The Shame of Nakedness, The Shame of Being Naked, The Shame of Nakedness. Again, we looked at just a few passages here in the scripture both in the beginning and in the end of the Bible where it's just bookended by the fact that when a person is naked that they should be ashamed. There should be something we should be ashamed to do. Nakedness is a shameful thing. You know, we're living in a society today that it seems to think otherwise. And we'll see, you know, say, well, what are you talking about? People are walking around naked. Well, there are people that are walking, you know, people that, you know, actually go to places called nudist colonies where they practice this. But I'm telling you, know, whether it's just full-on nudity, where it's just completely naked, you'd say, who's walking around naked? Well, the world would say nobody's walking around naked. But when we look at the biblical definition of naked tonight, naked, nakedness tonight, which we're going to do, we'll learn that there's actually quite a few people walking around naked according to the Bible. And it's something they ought to be ashamed of. It's not something that we should feel 
like, oh, we're just old fashioned, that, you know, we're just, you know, goody two shoes, that we're just, you know, uh, we're just, we're just prudes over here. No, we're biblical. We believe the Bible. We, we, our standard is God's standard. Our standard is not the world's standard. The world's standard is way down here, friend, way down here. And they allow for a lot of things to go on. And God's standard is, is up here. Now, when it comes to this, this idea of dress, God does not have this unattainable standard of how we should appear and dress. It's actually very attainable. It's very reasonable. And we're going to look at that as well tonight. If you would, go over to Isaiah chapter 20. Isaiah chapter 20. I reminded us of the story this morning in Exodus chapter 32. When Moses came down off the mountain and saw the people worshiping a false god, the Bible says Moses saw the pe that the people were naked. For Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies. Nakedness in the Bible is never praised. It's never anything good. After Genesis chapter 2, that's the only, that's, and you, really I wouldn't even call it a positive mention. It's just stating the facts that they weren't ashamed because there was no sin in the world. But after that, every time you read about nakedness, it's often associated with shamefulness, being ashamed. It's a disgrace. It's not something that should be joked about. It's not something that we should be participating in. We should not be walking around naked. It's a shame to do so. Isaiah chapter 20, look at verse 1. It says in the year that Tartan came to Ashdod when Sargon, the king of Assyria, sent him and fought against Ashdod and took it. At the same time, the Lord spake by Isaiah, the son of Amos, saying, Go and loose the sackcloth from off thy loins, and put off thy shoe from off thy foot. And he did so, walking naked and barefoot. So, you know, I'm glad God hasn't called him and his ministers to that today. <laughs> this one in particular. That he's asking him, hey, you're going to go walk naked and barefoot. And the Lord said, like as my... And you say, well, why would he do that? To make an example of what he's going to do to the children of Israel. He's making a very strong, very bold statement to them. Look, when God tells a guy to strip off his clothes and his shoes and go walk naked among his people and, and proclaim, you know, and preach, you know, that's a pretty serious thing. You better pay attention to what that guy says. He doesn't do that all the time. That's not, it's very rare. And he says in verse 3, The Lord said, Like as my servant Isaiah hath walked naked and barefoot three years for a sign and a wonder in Egypt and unto Ethiopia, so shall the king of Assyria lead away the Egyptians prisoners and the Ethiopians captive, young and old, naked and barefoot, even with their buttocks uncovered to the shame of Egypt. So, I mean, look, we're get, he's, so he's prophesying here against Ethiopia. He's prophesying against the e Egyptians, saying, God's going to do to you what I, what's been done to Isaiah. And he's trying to get their attention. Go over to 2 Samuel chapter 10. 2 Samuel chapter 10. But notice again, as it said in Isaiah, that their buttocks was uncovered, they were naked and barefoot to the shame of Egypt. Nakedness is a shameful thing. 2 Samuel chapter 10, look at verse 1, And it came to pass after this that the king of the children of Ammon died, and Hanun his son reigned in his stead. Then said David, I will show kindness unto Hanun the son of Nahash, as his father showed kindness unto me. And David sent to comfort him by the hand of his servants before his father. And David's servants came into the land of the children of Ammon, and the princes of the children of Ammon said unto Hanan their lord, Thinkest thou that David doth honor thy father, that he hath sent comforters unto thee? Hath not David rather sent his servants unto thee to search the city and to spy it out and to overthrow it? Wherefore Hanan, Hanan the, uh, took David's servants and shaved off the one half of their beards and cut their garments in the middle, even to their buttocks, and sent them away. And when, it, when they told it unto David, and he sent to meet them, because the men were greatly ashamed. Look, they were ashamed. that They didn't think <laughs> the funniest thing happened when we went to St. Hanan. You're not going to believe this, David. It's hilarious. They couldn't even face the king. They were so embarrassed. And I don't think it was just the beard getting shaved. I think it's the fact that he took, you know, exposed their lower half of their body. This is what the Bible's showing us here. It's a very shameful thing. You know, this, this reminds me of, you know, I don't want to make light of it too much here, but this is kind of like, a biblical, you know, a biblical example of being pantsed in the Bible. Everyone knows what being pantsed is. It's like this stupid gag that guys like to do to one another, where they sneak up behind their buddy and pull their pants down. Stupid. Never done it. Okay. Never had it done. Good reason to wear a belt. You know, if you're in sweatpants, draw that strong. You know, I mean, if you're around one of these guys, it's you know a jokester. 
You know, you don't want to be pants like that. You're going to be able to show your face. But it's a, it's a funny ha ha thing. But you tell you, I'm telling you, there's nothing funny about it. There's nothing funny about being naked. It's shameful. It's something that God uses to actually chastise people. And if you would go over to Isaiah chapter 47. Isaiah 47, the Bible says in Deuteronomy 28, Because thou hast served not the Lord thy God with, with joyfulness and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things, therefore thou shalt serve thine enemies which the Lord shall send against thee in hunger and thirst and in nakedness and in want of all things. And he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy, on thy neck until he have destroyed thee. And God's laying out the law there in Deuteronomy 28 and saying, hey, if you don't obey the law, if you don't keep the commandments, if you don't serve the Lord, you know, he's going to chastise you, and part of that chastisement is you're going to be naked. Probably referring to the fact that you're not going to have adequate clothing, or you might very well be just completely naked. You know, when you look into the slave trades and things like that, they would bring people over, and they would just, they would be naked, or very, you know, they'd have very little clothing on when they were in bondage. So you say, well, you convinced me, you know, the Bible doesn't paint a pretty picture of being naked. It's not something, it's actually something that's quite shameful something that happens to people when they're being mocked or ridiculed. It's something that happens to people when they're being chastened by God. So we, really what we ought to do tonight is take some time to figure out what, what, what is biblical nakedness? What does it mean to be naked biblically? I mean, the world's definition is you just don't have any clothes on at all. That's their definition of nakedness. But is that the Bible's definition of nakedness? It isn't. I should have had you keep some bookmarks, but I'll just repeat these to you for sake of time. But did you notice when I was reading how the buttocks being uncovered are associated with being naked? The posterior anatomy, right? It says they, in, uh, in Isaiah that even with their buttocks uncovered, talking about how they were naked and barefoot, even with the buttocks uncovered. You know, having your backside exposed in nakedness. And these guys want to walk around with their pants all the way down here and have some boxer shorts on. You're about, that, you're about this much material away from being naked. And by the way, that's something that started in prison with homosexuals. And that's a fact. You can look that up. There's, that's where, that, that's where that, that sagging movement came from. A bunch of fags in prison meant I'm available for you know what. That's why you want to walk around looking like? It's ridiculous. <coughs> it's stupid. Having the buttocks uncovered, it said, you know, we notice with David's servants, when they made them naked, where did they cut off their clothes at? Right here, and showed the buttocks. But boy, a lot of people today like walk around just having their buttocks exposed. You see the girls, they walk around with these shorts that come all the way up here, and they got their, the bottom part of their butt hanging out. You ought to be ashamed. If that's your daughter, you ought to be ashamed. And praise God, that isn't anybody's, but if it were... You know, I think, where's your dad? He lets you walk out like that? You know, he's probably not even the picture. Every other guy just get an eyeful. It's shameful. But that loin area is showing us here the buttocks, the buttocks, right? That loin area is what is considered bibli biblically to be naked. That is biblical nakedness. And there's more to it than that. We'll look at that. But the loin area... That this area, the lap area, the buttocks, that is biblical nakedness. Go to Isaiah 47, are you there? That's what the Bible defines as naked, okay? It says, come and sit down, verse 1, Isaiah 47. Come and sit down in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground, there is no throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans. For thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. Take the millstones and grind meal, uncover thy locks. Make bare the leg, and then he gets real specific, uncover the thigh. So what part of the body is he talking about? The thigh, right in here, right? From the knee to the waist. Uncover the thigh. Pass over the rivenous. Thy nakedness shall be uncovered, yea, thy shame shall be seen. So the Bible is showing us here that having this part of your body exposed is considered nakedness. And that doing so is shameful. Now, is there anybody walking around that has this part of their body exposed today? Oh, yeah. All the time. Everywhere. It's normal. In fact, you read that, you go, really? That's what the Bible defines it as. That portion of your body is nakedness, according to the Bible. You say, well, I don't know about that. Okay, well, you know what? Then the Bible's not your authority. 
then the Bible's not your final authority. The world standard is your authority. Well, I, don't just, I just don't see what's wrong with wearing short shorts up to here. It's naked. I don't see what's wrong with going to the pool and wearing a bikini bottom. It's naked. Well, it's a one piece. It doesn't cover the thigh. You know, and here's the thing. People were swimming for a long time before those stupid bathing suits came along. <laughs> Did you realize that? You don't have to, that you can take wet clothes off and put on dry ones when you're done? Is that really why people want to wear that stuff? No, it's because they want to show off. They want to they flaunt what they have. As if that's something special. What did you do to get that? You were born. <laughs> look, everyone else born with two legs. <laughs> Check them out. You know? <laughs> and look, this is something that probably applies more to women today than men. I guarantee you if I were to hike up my, my pant leg to about here, nobody in this room is going to struggle with lust. No one's going to be going, oh man, Brother Corbin. <laughs> Everyone's going to start laughing. Probably have to put some sunglasses on. It's blinding me. <clears throat> but I'm trying to make the point tonight, this is what the Bible defines as naked. And it's important to understand this, not, so, not only so we know what, what nakedness is, but also what it isn't. And we'll talk more about that in a minute, too. Go over to Exodus chapter 28. Exodus chapter 28. In Jeremiah 13, God, pouring out some more judgment, says, Therefore I will discover thy skirts upon thy face, and thy shame, that thy shame may appear. And he's talking about appearing, you know, the shame appearing, the nakedness. What does it mean to discover? Well, in the, another, way, another way the word discover was used, we don't use it the same way today, but was to uncover, to discover something. Like if you were, like something, you're looking for just something that was covered up. Oh, I've discovered that my such and such thing was under this. You're discovering. Does that make sense? Cover, discover. So he's saying, I'm going to discover thy skirt upon thy face. What he's talking about, the goddess is, is of course, he's speaking, you know, in, in, in not in literal terms, but he's saying, look, I'm going to make you so ashamed. It's as if someone took your skirt and pulled it up over your face and showed everybody what was under there. And that's going to be a very shameful thing. What he's going to say is, I'm going to shame you in front of everybody. That's what God's saying here. But also, the application is that we can understand that, again, what's being discovered when the skirt comes upon the face? This part of the body. Right here. And no, skirt is not an old word for shirt which I've heard some people try to make that application, which, boy, they had to do some backflips to do that. That's stu Anyway, we won't go there. Exodus chapter 28, where you are, it says in verse 40, And if for Aaron's sons thou shalt make coats, and thou shalt make them for girdles and bonnets, and thou shalt, ma thou shalt make for them for the glory and for beauty, and thou shalt put them upon Aaron thy brother and his sons with him, and shall anoint him and consecrate him and sanctify them, that they may minister me unto me in the priest's office, and thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness. Now, what's, what are breeches? These are pants. These are like short pants, right? Everyone wants to act like pants were something that were invented by Levi Strauss when he was trying to clothe some coal miners or something. Pants are not that advanced of technology. They've been around for a long time. In fact, even back then, they know how to make them. And he's saying, look, they make them linen breeches to do what? To cover their nakedness. From the loins even unto the thighs they shall reach. Saying they're going to cover this entire area. And what is it doing when it's covering this area? It's covering their nakedness. So over and over again we're seeing just over and over what does the Bible define as nakedness? This part of the body all the way around. And that's it. <clears throat> and I want to take a minute and just point out the fact that what we haven't seen is anything from the waist up is not considered nakedness. It's not. You can't tell me that anything from the waist up is nakedness. And this is important to understand because some people want to make the argument that if a woman openly breastfeeds her child, which my wife does, by the way, that she's somehow naked. That she ought to be ashamed. Even in her own house in front of her own children. See, that's ridiculous. I know, but people preach it. More than one person have preached that. One more, more than one person has gotten up behind a pulpit and made that a standard in the church. And that will never be a standard here. Now look, people can have preferences all day long. If people want to cover up when they breastfeed at home, out in public, that's their business. <laughs> I mean, I'm never going to come to somebody's wife and be like, 
you need to uncover. <laughs> it's not my business, and it'd be stupid. It's a preference. But I'm not going to get up and preach that you must, you must breastfeed uncovered. But don't ever come to my wife and tell her that she ought to be ashamed for openly breastfeeding or any other person's wife or any other, any other woman that chooses to do that. Because you can't find that in Scripture. You can't find in Scripture where the breast is nakedness. Now, I'm not saying that breasts themselves are sensual. They are. But every time they're used in that manner, notice it's talking about breasts plural. Okay? It says that, you know, the, 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 that the Leviathan draweth out the breast and giveth suck to her young. Right? So breasts have both the utilitarian and a sensual aspect to them. Now, unfortunately, we live in a society today that is completely focused only on the sensual aspect of breasts. That's why they're in every beer commercial. That's why they're used to sell things and just objectify women. Okay? <laughs> I'm not discounting that, but I am saying this. They're not nakedness. And we're going to get into what they are. You know, what, we're going to talk about immodesty here in a minute. I believe that you can be immodest without being naked. Okay? <clears throat> But notice, and if you would, go to Song of Solomon, if you haven't gone there. Song of Solomon. The Bible's very clear what nakedness is, and I want to make sure I'm being perfectly clear. From here to here, and nothing else. From the waist to the thigh, nothing else is ever mentioned in association with nakedness. Notice, uh, notice in Song of Solomon how, in this, when I first heard this, it just, it just blew me away. I thought, this is such a great text to prove one, that the song of, that song of Solomon is not a lewd book. I've heard preachers, I've had pastors say, you shouldn't read Song of Solomon until after you're married. <laughs> Stupid. Every word of God is pure. Amen. It's for everybody. I'll let my, I'll let my youngest child, who's ki- the, as soon as they're able to read, they're free to read any part of God's word, including Song of Solomon. Because there's nothing inappropriate, there's nothing lewd, there's nothing crass in the song, book of Song of Solomon because it's God's word. That's why. <clears throat> and notice how in the Song of Solomon, God skips right over a certain part of the body when, he's, when the husband is describing the beauty of his wife. Look at verse 1. How beautiful are thy feet with shoes, O prince's daughter. Now, this guy is getting himself into hot water right away. When you start giving, you know, praising a woman for how good her feet look in shoes, she's going to tell you, well, you should see what I look like in this pair, and in this pair, and in this pair, and in this pair, and this pair. Oh, you like how, you know, I like shoes too, daddy-o, so let's see that credit card. Stupid joke. But it goes on, it says, how, how beautiful are thy feet with shoes, O prince's daughter, the joints of thy thighs. What are the joints of your thighs? It's called your knees. So why does it say like that? Because it sounds better. Your knees are like jewels. Your knees are like jewels. You know, the, thoi- the joints of thy thighs are like jewels. So he's going from the feet. He's literally describing this woman from the feet to the head. He says, the, 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 Thy knees are like jewels, the work of the hands of a cunning workman. I don't know. Maybe I need to try this and compli- compliment my wife's knees sometime. You know, you've got great knees, honey. <laughs> but notice, he go- once he gets here, he skips over all this and gets right to here. Right? He goes, the feet, the knees, and verse 2, thy navel. Did you see how he just skipped the thighs and the loins and the buttocks? Why? Because God's word is pure and God isn't crass and God isn't losing. He's not going to refer to things that are nakedness and go into great detail about that part of the body. Thy navel is like a round goblet which wanteth not liquor. I don't know that that would fly today either with your wife. Don't try this at your own risk. Okay? <laughs> thy belly is like a heap of wheat set about with lilies. Boy, the, the Bible has a kind of, the, they seem to have a different standard of beauty back then, didn't they? He said, oh, you, you're, like a, you're like a rake with a trash bag on it or something. <laughs> you know? your, 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 your body is like a wire, you know. He's saying, no, it's like a heap of wheat set about with lilies. Thy two breasts, oh, oh. Thy two breasts are like two young rows that are twins. Thy neck is as the tower of ivory. Thine eyes like the fish pools of Heshbon by the gate of bath Rabin. Thy nose is as the tower of Lebanon. Thy nose, right? You got a great nose. Which looketh toward Damascus. Thine head upon thee is like Carmel. The hair of thine head like purple. What, what kind of girl is this? What's she doing? 
The king is held in the guys. It's saying it's, you know, because purple is associated with royalty. How fair and how pleasant art thou, O love for delight. So he just described this woman in great detail, his wife, and he didn't mention that one part of the body. That's the one part. Now, did he talk about breasts? Yeah. You know, we get all squeamish about that word today because we've been trained to by the media and to instantly associate it with just everything carnal. But you know, it's, it's, it's a very natural part of the body that is to be praised. You know, in the context of marriage, mind you. Because here's the thing, if breasts are nakedness, then the Bible's being lewd here, isn't it? Then the Bible is talking about something that's inappropriate. Notice how it skips something that's inappropriate. We know is inappropriate. We go to other scriptures. It's shameful. It's nakedness. The buttocks, the buttocks, the, th the, the, the thighs, the loins. It's all associated with nakedness and shamefulness. And the Bible, when he's praising her, is careful to skip that part of the body. But then it does talk about the breasts. So is the Bible lewd or not? It's not. Therefore, we can conclude that the breasts indeed are not nakedness. <clears throat> The loin area is the only area unmentioned. Now, does that mean that breasts should go uncovered today? That we should all, that all we should, you know, men and women included, just, should just all go topless from now on? Well, you heard the preaching. No. And that's what, pe and that, you know, and I say that, and it sounds crazy, but people accuse, you know, people who hold this point of view of, th of saying that. Oh, those people are faithful word. They just want all the women running around topless. You're an idiot if you think that. You really think that's what we're teaching up here? Moron. People think that, though. That's what we're trying to say. That we just want every woman out here just uncovered. I mean, I heard one moron. You know, he said, uh, he said you know, well, we, we tell our women to cover up in church because we're not like Favor Word where he, they just got women taking off their shirts and just feeding, feeding their kids like that. That's never happened. Ever. I've never seen... A woman, my wife has never seen another nursing mother just take off her shirt and exp Because here's the thing, uh, you know, newsflash, you don't have to take your shirt off to feed your child from the breast, to breastfeed your child. You can lift up one part of your shirt and expose a very small patch of skin, the nipple area, and feed your child. You know, I'll be, I'll be, when my wife's breastfeeding, I'll be sitting at home, I won't even realize she is. I'll look over and go, oh, and there's a baby there. The baby's head is blocking the view. And by the way, and, and, you know, and I don't want to get too crude or crass here, but if you're the type of person that's struggling with, 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 with lust over a lactating breast, you got bigger issues. <laughs> you got serious problems. You know, I, you know, that's not, you know, and again, it's just not, you know, it's not doing it for me. Okay, let me just say that, that put it that way. That kind of thing doesn't get the motor running. All right? <clears throat> but we're not teaching that here, you know? The same guy that would teach that a woman has to take her top off to feed her child is the same type of guy that would drop his drawers to use a urinal. Mm. <laughs> you know, you don't have to do that. No offense to anybody here that does that. But there's <laughs> things called zippers and flies, you know, that facilitate being able to use the bathroom without having to drop your drawers on the floor. That's the same mentality. It's that dumb, okay? And I, I know I'm making a bit of a joke here. But this gets me a little fired up because, you know, here's the thing. You know, I don't want to go on about breastfeeding, but it's an important function. It's a very important function. You know, because we teach here, and the Bible teaches, more importantly, that women, and that, that couples are to be fruitful and multiply. That they are, and then we are against contraceptives of any kind. No birth control whatsoever. None of these man-made devices to control birth. Totally against it. Okay believe children are a blessing. We should have as many as God gives us. That's my stand. That's, the, that's biblical teaching. You know, maybe you should have gone to that a little bit more tonight, but that is, I've preached on that in the past, okay? So when you preach that, and when you tell that to, to a family, when you, and then a woman hears that, and now she's thinking, now I'm just, every nine, ten months, I'm going to be pregnant. Which is very, which can happen and does happen. But did you know that God has provided women a way to space their children naturally? And it's called breastfeeding. Now, obviously, it's not 100% effective all the time. There's exceptions to every rule. But all of my kids are about two years spaced apart. And you know what? We didn't use any kind of birth control at all. You know what we, we, know what we did? Breastfeeding. And I'm not saying, you know, that when, you know, during the day, whenever the kid got a little fussy, mom pumped a bottle and gave it to her. I'm saying whenever that kid wanted to feed, 
that kid fed. In the middle of the night, co-slept with the child. Say, oh, you're going to lay on your kid. Never happened. <laughs> okay? you don't, you're not going to crush your children in the sleep. That, when that happens, there's other factors involved. You know, people are, are drunk or stoned or whatever. Okay? That's when that kind of thing happens. So we sleep with the, you know, the, the nursing child sleeps with us in the bed and you know, wakes mom up in the middle of the night and wants to feed, and mom just gives the child the breast, goes back to sleep, the kid eats, falls asleep. And I don't know all the science behind it, and I'm not an expert, but I know it works. Because I've, I've seen it work in my family, I've seen it work in several other different families, large families, where they practice this, and it works. <coughs> where kids are naturally spaced due to breastfeeding. And that is, that is something that God has given to women to control and regulate pregnancies. In the way it works with their hormones and prevents them from going back into a cycle and so on and so forth, it, God has designed it that way. You know, and it's, and it's quite, you know, and I don't want to, you know, be, become the, the poster boy for breastfeeding up here, but, you know, it's, it's, it's a very nurturing thing for, for a child to breastfeed with the mother. There's a lot of bonding that takes place. It's, it's a very, you know, there's a lot behind it. I don't know a lot about it because I don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> haven't done it since I was that big. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is the reason why I'm kind of parking it here and talking about the fact that the breasts aren't naked and then it's okay to just breastfeed openly, you know, and, and, to, and to not, you know, feel like you're going to be shamed if you do it and why you should actually practice that is because that's the one means that God has given women to regulate their pregnancies without using some kind of, you know, man-made contraption. So that's important to understand that. You know, and there's a lot, you know, and if, if you don't know a lot about that subject, you should read up on it, you should study it. You sh there's a lot out there. There's a lot, people who are much more knowledgeable and can just explain how that all works better than I can without, and they probably won't make as many dumb jokes as I do. <laughs> but here's the thing, you know, we, we, do, we do preach that, we do teach that breasts are not nakedness. If women decide they want to openly breastfeed, you know, and obviously there's, you know, some, if, if some people have, can go overboard with it, you know, they, they're, they're showing too much, you know, they could go a little crazy, but you know what, it's, it's not so, so much where it's just like minds are being defiled by this, okay? And another lady can come to another lady and make, you know, suggestions politely and draw attention and show them how to do it, so on and so forth with that, okay? But we're not teaching that, you know, just because breasts aren't naked, that women can just, you know, go topless and we're going to be fine with it. Because here's the thing, if you were to do that, that would be immodest. Now, I, wouldn't, I couldn't sit here up and say the Bible teaches that that would be naked because that's not what the Bible teaches. I will say, however, that the Bible does teach that that, among other things, would be immodest and therefore would be sinful. So everyone can read a sigh of relief tonight. <laughs> Nothing's going to change there. Why would it be immodest because just as breasts serve a very utilitarian function in feeding children and nurturing children and regulating a woman's hormones and controlling childbirth, they also have a very sensual aspect. I mean, why else did Solomon take the time to describe them when he's admiring his wife? He goes into it. So we're not so stupid to think that they don't play that role. They do. Therefore, because they have a sensual component involved, if you were to just go around you know, showing them off to whatever degree you want to, that would be immodest. Because they are alluring. Because they do draw the eye. Because they do draw attention to oneself. And anybody with a set of eyes knows this is true. And any, any woman who, who you know, wants to draw that kind of attention knows how to do it through the way she dresses. Or fails to dress, I should say. Now, let me just take a minute here. Go over to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. It would be immodest for a woman to do that, to flaunt her breasts in that way. She wouldn't be naked, but she would be immodest. Bible says, you know, not the Bible, rather, Wikipedia says, Modesty, sometimes known as demureness, is a mode of dress and deportment which intends to avoid uh, the encouraging of carnal attraction in others. You know, I'm replacing that word with carnal. 
The word modesty comes from the Latin word mod modestus. I don't speak Latin or any other dead language, which means keeping with measure, keeping within measure. So that's what it means to be modest. If a woman is modestly dressed, she's appropriately dressed. She's keeping within measure. She's not you know, going out of bounds with her dress. Standards of modesty are culturally and context dependent and very widely. Now that's true, isn't it? But we also know that, that a woman is not to draw attention to herself and that if she's doing that through the way she dresses, she's not modest. Our standards must be biblical. Look, we can't look to the world and say, tell us what modesty is. Because you, you'll see how the world will have your daughter's dressing. You'll see the world, how the world will have your son's dressing. The hairdos they'll put on. The clothes they'll put on. If you let the world define modesty for them. Our standards are biblical. <clears throat> and, and, you know, we have to make sure it's biblical because, and it's especially important for people that are going to teach this, you know, parents, preachers, so on and so forth, because we're not at liberty just to impose preferences as, as the commandments of men. Now, as parents in your home, every, every parent has the right to have their own standard to some degree in this, in this in, you know, that there, there's, there's wiggle room here for them to say this is appropriate, this is not. This is too tight, that is not. This is long and flowing, this is not. The neckline will be here. The, you, the, 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 you will wear shorts that come down this far on the boys and so on and so forth. I understand there's a little bit of wiggle room there, okay? But you have to understand that those are, again, preferences, and we are not at liberty to impose preferences. And I'm just taking the time to talk about that because of the fact that churches in, impose preferences. Who's ever been in a church where a church just imposed their own preferences? They didn't have any biblical standard. They just said, hey, we're just, this is, we just pulled this out of thin air. I know I have. I was in a church where you couldn't use the word pregnant. And not that they would you know, say kick you out or anything, but if you use the word pregnant around the, you know, the pastor's wife, you would upset her. And I mean, you would upset her to the point where she's taking aside and just, you shouldn't use that word pregnant. Why? Because when you use the word pregnant, everyone knows how you got that way. Yeah. <laughs> any, any adult who's come to the knowledge about those things understands how that works. And if they don't understand, if they're too young to understand that, me saying pregnant isn't going to clue them in at all. And it's this overly prudish, self-righteous attitude is where that comes from. Well, I'm just so holy that I don't even use the word pregnant. Okay, well, what, what would you like? What would you like us to, to use, you precious little thing? With child. I'm not kidding. <laughs> this is out there. And this is why I'm, you know, I'm kind of getting it off my chest after 17 years, <laughs> however long it's been. <laughs> But, you know, that's the thing. I'm saying to say, well, my, my wife is pr with child. <laughs> then you can say it around your relatives because you get so used to saying with child. She's with child. You mean pregnant? <laughs> yeah, that. Well, I just use with child because the word pregnant, oh, I just can't stand it. Well, how about, how about a more biblical term? How about conceived seed? That's a biblical term. <laughs> and that's, you know, that kind of, that's a little more telling than pregnant, isn't it? Conceived seed. So, I mean, it's funny how that one biblical term is okay, but you wouldn't want this one. So, again, everything that we're kind of going in tonight, you have to take with a grain of salt that there's room for preferences. And preferences are okay until you start imposing them on other people and teaching for doctrines the commandments of men and making the word of God of none effect. And people do this type of thing, unfortunately. So let's define what biblical immodesty. Are you there in 1 Timothy chapter 2? Look at verse 8. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Now before we move on, I want you to notice that he's saying not only that the men should pray and lift up holy hands, but they should do it with a certain attitude. They should have a right attitude about how they're going to go about doing this. Without wrath and doubting. Meaning not being angry and not, being, and not doubting. Why do I really have to do this? Is this really what I have to do? Oh. 
guess I'll pray then. I mean, if I have to lift up holy hands and pray everywhere, I guess I will, because the Bible said so. That's a bad attitude about the Bible. You know, you can do things, you can keep the commandments with a bad attitude. He's saying, look, I will that when pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, okay? In like manner also. Why did I take the time to explain that? Because he goes on and applies that same attitude to women. He says, in like manner also, in the same way, with the same attitude, without wrath and without doubting, women adorn themselves in modest apparel. With shamefacedness and sobriety. Shamefacedness, meaning... You know, think about being, you know, with people that, that don't want to draw attention to themselves, they, they, they kind of, they cover, they hide, right? They're trying, they would be ashamed to have too much, you know, a, a attention put upon them. To be lifted up in front of everybody and say, hey, look at so-and-so. They, they, oh, don't do that. You know, that's shamefacedness and sobriety. They're, they're not, uh, you know, they're, they're serious. You're taking this seriously. In modest apparel. So what is modest apparel? Well, obviously, this apparel has to be something that, like for everybody, men and women, has to cover the nakedness from here to here, right? But does that mean that we should all just go topless? Not if it draws attention. Would a woman going topless draw inordinate attention? Yes. <coughs> and he goes on and says, not with, with, with uh, modest apparel, not with broided hair. No, I'm not saying you can't have, you know, pigtails in. You can't have a ponytail. But you know the broided hair where they just, they are spending just hours and hours. There's like three women involved to get this look, right? Now, if somebody, you know, a special day, the wedding day, you want to do something, you know, I get that, okay? But if, if a woman's goal in life is to walk out the door every day with just this elaborate hairdo, you know, she didn't have time to feed the kids breakfast or see, kiss dad out the door and wish him have a good day. You know, she didn't have time to read her Bible or teach the kids because she spent hour, her entire morning was just, you know, making sure every strand of hair was in this elaborate do. That's not modest. So that she can, what, go to Walmart and have him go, oh, nice hair. Who's your stylist? Where do you get that done? Why? Why is that immodest? Because it's drawing attention to what? To yourself. Is that drawing attention to God? Is that glorifying your God? When you have a, you know, $150 haircut or something like that? No, it's not. <coughs> They're to do it not with broided hair or gold, right? You know, and this would get into the area of jewelry. And again, I believe there's, there's room here for preferences. But if you're just every ring or every finger, big fat ring, big, you, you, you know when somebody is going overboard with the gold, the bling, right? When you look like you could be in a rap, you know, a rap video with the amount of gold you got on, you're, you're immodest, right? Where the first thing that everyone notices about you is, is the, all the rings and the everything else, you know, the face piercings everywhere. That would be immodest. Or costly array. How about just real expensive clothing? You know, clothing that just, you know, maybe it covers everything up just the right way, but it's just, it's just, over, it, the whole way that it, it was just made and it was, it was bought to do one thing, to get everybody talking about my new clothes. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't, you know, you have to dress like, you know, some Mormon in northern Utah. <laughs> You know, where it's just these pastels and these big, poofy, giant, you've seen them, and the bonnets and everything else, you know. Don't get me wrong. And it's okay to put on something nice and have somebody say, hey, that's, that's a nice dress. You look nice today. We should try to dress nice. And you know what? You should, you should try to, and you know, and she's not here, and I know she wouldn't mind, but my wife, you know, when we talk about this type of, whenever the subject comes up, she'll often express to me and tell me about how when she first started coming to church and learning these standards, she would look at some of the late, you know, one or a couple of the ladies in the church and say, I can't dress like that. Not that she was against wearing dresses, but she didn't want to look like grandma's, you know, sofa. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't want to look like that, you know, like she should smell like ginger snaps and have blue hair. 
But then she noticed that there were these other younger ladies, younger moms, that were dressed modestly, but they looked nice. They looked stylish. They looked, you know, they, because here's the thing, people can dress modestly or they can dress and cover everything up and they can even wear these long dresses, but they'll go out and then they'll put that doily on their head, you know, and why are they doing that? Look at me. That's not any more modest than bikini top. You say, well, nothing's showing. Yeah, but it's, it's, that's not what modesty is. It's not what exposing something necessarily. It's, are you drawing attention to you? Are you going, is what you're wearing meant only to get the eyes on you? Then it's immodest. And my wife, you know, she was relieved to find that you could wear, you know, a nice colored t-shirt that, you know, as long as it's not too tight in the wrong places to draw attention to those areas and could wear, you know, a jean skirt and not have to look like grandma's sofa. Where was I at here? So that's, you know, that's what's talking about costly array, the right kind of clothes, not putting on all this stuff to just draw attention. So obviously, women, you know, should dress in a way that does not draw attention to themselves. And, you know, I'm, I know I'm parking on kind of going after women, but here's the thing, it's kind of a woman's issue because men should not be so effeminate to even think like this. And unfortunately, that's a thing today. Guys are probably standing in front of the mirror in their skinny jeans going, oh, how's this, you know, how's this look on my butt? Before they walk out the door. That's a, you know, the, the dress isn't even, you know, the skinny jeans are a different thing. The fact that you would even think along those lines is a, means you're effeminate, which is a sin in and of itself. You know, I'm, I'm glad, you know, like my wife kind of gives me a hard time, but I'm glad that I have like, very, a very small wardrobe and then she practically has to beg me to go get new clothes. Because it's not because I'm trying to just live some austere life. It's because I'm just that absent-minded as a dude. And probably every guy in here is that way to some degree or another. We'll, we'll get a new pair of pants when the other ones finally have too many holes in them. Or that shirt, you know, that, you know, that stain, I can't cover that one with the tie. It's got to go. You know, or, you know, the collar is finally, you know, the, 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 the whiskers have finally worn down the collar to where it's fraying. Now it's time for a new shirt. Not because, well, I wonder what's in style this season. It's past May Day. I shouldn't wear white. <laughs> you think that thought goes through my head? I mean, look at my haircut, people. <laughs> I know it's new, but I, I did this. I was like, man, I love not even have to think about, do I have pillow head? And that's about the extent of how, about my, how much thought I put into my hairdo. Does it look like I showered or not? Now you can never tell, at least from the way I look. Don't worry, it happens. Showers are taken. Look, men should not, this shouldn't even be a concern for them. So I understand it's kind of a ladies' issue, and that's the way it should be. And if you're a dude in here, and you're, you know, you're, you're wondering about whether or not your clothes are modest or if they're drawing too much attention to you, you've got other issues. You gotta deal with that, okay? And just man up, you know, go down to, go down, just go down to, you know, go to J.C. Penney's and just buy some Dickies and Carhartts and just get some cargo jeans and Dickies shirts and just start dressing like a man. Nobody in here, I know, struggles with that, but. <coughs> <coughs> You know, and the, the kind of the inspiration for this whole sermon was the fact that I read this new news article, and I haven't preached on this subject in about a year. And I, and I was just, you know, going through my Google news feed, kind of seeing what's going on in the world, trying to see if there's any sermon ideas in there. And thankfully there was. And, you know, I kind of went back and forth on whether or not I should name this person, even though she's been named publicly in the news. And I decided not to, you know, just because she's probably just a lost young woman who doesn't really have any sense, you know, and maybe... You know, and she's kind of already put herself out there to be mocked and ridiculed as it is. I'm sure she's got enough of it, doesn't need it from, from me. And that's really not the point. Uh, but I do want to make me, why are you preaching this about modesty and dress? Because I'm telling you, the world has lost its mind in this area. I mean, it lost its mind. You know, we went to Tombstone today, and we saw the woman whose job was to play the whore. And I don't mean like the biblical term, like, you know, when a woman, you know, would play the whore in the father's house. I mean, that was her job to go down there and pretend to be the whore. And you could tell who it is because, you know, she's got the flashy dress and everything. And, you know, I, I, and I saw her walk by and I said, that must be the town whore. 
I almost want to stop her like, are you the whore? <laughs> well, yeah. Say so that'd be inappropriate. Hey, that's what she's there to do. She's there in Tombstone to play the whore. How would you like to answer, you know, what do you do for a living? Oh, I, I work in Tombstone. What do you do? I play the whore. Okay. But you know what I thought? I thought that woman, even playing the whores back then, from that time period, are more modest than the women today who are not whores. They're dressed more modestly than women who are not whores today. And there's women, they, they turn up all the time. You see them walk around. They could go for a whore today. You say, you know, you know, the Bible talks about a woman that wore the attire of an harlot. It didn't say she was one. It just said she looked like one. Did you know you can look like a whore without being one today? Because what is a, how does a whore dress? She dresses in all the ways to sell what she's selling. Right? To draw men in and to encourage them to buy. You know, and there's this lady... And I don't want to, I'm just going to, I'm just for the sake of, you know, protecting, well, I won't call her the innocent. For not just, you know, piling it upon her. I'm just going to call her, trying to think of a name that's not going to be anybody we know. You know, how about Bertha, right? Bertha, okay? And this is a real person, but I'm changing her name. She got on an airline two days ago, or tempted to, and she was told by the airline, you can't come on dressed like that. You need to cover that up. And she had a skirt that went from here to here. And I mean, it looked like it was put on with a vacuum. <laughs> like someone put on there and sucked all the air out of it. Like she was, you know, someone wrapped her in a skirt, like saran wrap. But that wasn't the worst part. The worst part was the top. Again, not nakedness, incredibly immodest. I showed my wife the picture because I had a picture of it. There she is, right? <laughs> She's like, it's true. <laughs> he really did. And she said, I've seen bras that cover more than that. Wow. Brassiers, undergarments that covered more than this woman had. And, you know, this woman was very well endowed. Let me just say that. And I'm telling you, this top was like, it came around the neck, and it was just a straight V, like all the way almost to the belly button. And it was just like these two thin straps. Walking around in public like this, trying to get on an airline, and they're like, even the world's just like, no way. You're not, you can't come on this airline like that. And she got all offended and took to Twitter. You know, where every snowflake goes. Twitter, social media. <clears throat> and they said, look, it's our policy, it's our privilege as a private business to deny you the right to travel on our airline when you're dressed like that. And you know what? She was immodest. She was lewd, lewdly dressed by any reasonable standard. And she, and she makes the case in, in her statement. She says, well, it's not like my nipples were showing. Is that the standard? So, I, so if you took a couple of Dixie cups and a, pair of str and a string and made yourself a little garment to wear, you're, you're no longer lewd? Look, this is the mentality that's out there today. This is what people think passes as modest. And who are you to judge? You know, that airline, their stock went up in my book. I said, I'm going to make sure I fly that airline every time. I already was anyway, because everyone knows that Southwest is the best, right? <laughs> so there's a clue under this story, right? And I said, I'm, their stock went up with me. I would have hated to have to get on that airline and sat next to that woman. That would have been just like the whole flight. I mean, how do you eat dressed like that? How do you even eat? crumbs going everywhere. It's disgusting. <laughs> you know, I'm, try, I'm, I'm not trying to be too crass up here tonight, but this is the world we're living in. You think this is an isolated incident? Or incident? My wife, when I was, we were talking about the story, she, she pulled up another story. Oh, yeah, I remember reading about, I think it was a woman in Minnesota. Of all places that you would wear a bikini top, Minnesota. <laughs> I'm assuming it's like middle of August when this happens, because any time of year, you know, just buy the woman a coat, you know for more than one reason, you know, she doesn't get frostbite and die. Minnesota, right? I guess they only get a chance to wear that type of thing so many months out of the year, so they just, I'm going to wear it everywhere I go, including Walmart. And Walmart's like, you can't come in here with that. She bought the bikini top there and put it on, I guess is what happened, and got asked to leave. 
Even the world, even the world knows. This is, you, that's inappropriate. But somehow if they get around a body of water, all of a sudden it's like, well, all bets are off. You know, it just makes perfect sense, right? <coughs> but look, this woman trying to get on this flight, you know, was lewdly dressed by any reasonable standard. And she goes to Twitter to share her story along with a photo of the outfit in question. In the selfie, Bertha is seen wearing a low-cut top and a long red skirt. Look, low-cut top is putting it mildly. And you say, this is a really obscure uh, news story. I, I, I Googled it, woman denied boarding. It was like in the LA Times, New York Post, several, she was from Chicago, so several news, article, news agencies picked it up. It was national news that this poor woman who was wearing a garment that one article literally defined as a, I hadn't even heard of this, arm, of this garment, a bralette, I guess is the thing. I think that's what it's called. But basically it's a bra with no support. That's literally what she was wearing. And, nothing, and, and that, that was it. That was what she was like, hey, this is me. I'm in an undergarment that offers no support. That's what I've chosen to wear to the airport in public. And it was like dozens of new Jays. I read one guy's stupid blog, and I think he was just suffering from like male privilege or white guilt or whatever, because he's just like, oh, the airline was just so out of line. She has every right to just be who she is and everything like that. I'm just like, shut up. Shut up. Anyone with a brain in their head is repulsed by that kind of thing. You know, and the captain in the story comes out and is just like, oh, girl, they're just hating on you because you're looking good. And she's like, well, I don't take this very lightly. And the captain ends up having to lend her, she misses her first flight, I guess. I think that's how the story goes. Lends her a t-shirt. And she gets on the flight wearing the t-shirt, takes a picture, just fuming, you know. And she's got these, you know, speaking of immodest, if these nails, they can't even be the real nails. I mean, they're like, they're huge. You look like it's something off of a bird of prey. Like, are you an osprey of some kind? Are you, are you, gonna, are you trying to snatch, you know, like, you know, steelhead or salmon from a river? On your op uh, is, what are, you, are you swooping down and picking up varmin in your spare time? Like, what are you doing with these claws on your hands? I guess it's just more to paint. You know, and that's, that's again, that falls in preference. But I'm telling you, when you've got nails that are coming out to here, how do you do anything with that? How do you even function? You see them on the smartphone's like... Trying to, it's, just, it's not worth it, honey. You know, it's not worth it. You don't look that good. And it's, you know, it's probably going to, if they're real, you're going to get hurt at some point. But she's got that, the big hoop earrings, you know, and just, it's just, you could just tell this young lady, and I use that term very loosely, I should say woman, was just all about her, you know. So she gets this t-shirt given to her so she can board this flight. She takes it off mid-flight. She says, you, you can't oppress me. You can't hold me down. And they're like, well, you have to speak to an agent when you get off. And, you know, the airline, you know, tried to save some face. And they said, look, this is our policy. They showed it like, look, we have the right to deny people. We have a boarding agreement with people. And if you're going to wear things that are offensive to other passengers, we have the right to deny you. And it got me thinking, you know, next time I see one of these young punks, this is another thing that's going on around through these these adolescent punks walking around with these, with, with these shirts of a picture of an of a immodestly dressed woman. Have you seen this? This is a thing now. Now they got these guys that are they're just wearing basically porno on their shirt. I mean, it's not hardcore or anything like that, but it's like, you know, the swimsuit. And by the way, that's pretty much porno. They're just wearing this on their shirt, just like, hey, out in public, look, did you want to see a, a, a half-dressed woman with all her cleavage in a seductive pose? Because here you go, it's right there for everyone to see. I saw that, I wanted to go rip it off the kid and throw it in his mom's face. But now I know, next time I'm just going to go to the book, d up to the counter, the ticket, the ticket counter and say, that kid's sure to offend me. And it's defiling my child. Thank you, my kids weren't there. If they were, I'd say, and it's defiling my child's mind. I'd, I'd appreciate if you told them to turn that inside out. <coughs> I'm glad that I know that that's a policy that's out there. So that's kind of what, you know, and here, here's what she said. I don't understand how my body part is obscene. Yeah, obviously. Obviously, you don't understand that. It's not like they're out. It's not like my breasts are out. Yeah. <laughs> is, that, is that the standard? Topless? 
Anything other than topless is okay. This is where the world's at. And you know what? She was not immediately available to comment for Fox News. So, you know, there's news agencies reaching out. Hey, we would like to talk to you. Apparently, she's had enough, you know, from Twitter or whatever. Maybe she came to her senses. Maybe her grandmother saw it in the news. It was like, t called her up and gave her a what for. And said, what are you doing? And, and talked some sense into her. So, I you know, that, that was kind of the, the what it inspired this whole sermon. And I said, you know what? We need to, you know, I, I doubt anyone in the room is struggling with any of these issues, but, you know, we're all going to be raising children one day. We should probably understand where we stand on this. And, you know, if, if you feel like, you know, maybe you're being held to certain standards, understand, and, and you don't accept, understand why or you don't agree with it, it's because the world's lost its mind. It's not because we're a bunch of prudes. It's not because we're just a bunch of sticklers. We're just sticks in the mud around here. It's like, no, we, it's because we value women for more than just their physical appearance. It's because we don't want to just objectify women as just these, these objects to be lusted after. You know, their mothers, their wives, their sisters, you know, in, in blood, their sisters in Christ. You know, we should look at them with all purity. You know, that's why we have these standards, because the world has lost, and it's not, it's not us that's changed. These standards have never changed. And there was a time, within even a lifetime ago, the world understood this. And the world lived by these standards. They're the ones that are just in a nosedive, that are just morally bankrupt, and this whole country is just, in, just plummeting in just a crash course to hell, spiritually and morally. And, the, and, and everyone's just walking around like nothing's going on. And, the, and the, the alarm's going off. Pull up. Pull up. It's, it's beyond that now. It's just like eject, eject, eject. <laughs> All hope is lost. The G's are too many. You're not going to, you know, you need to just get out of this. It's the world that's lost its mind, not us. You know, and we're going to keep looking stranger and stranger to the world. And that's just fine with me. Because I look right back at them. I say, some of you are freaks. I don't know what other word to use than just, you're a freak. Something is, you have lost your mind if you think what you're wearing is appropriate to wear in any setting, in any situation, publicly. It's, it's disgraceful. And you know what? No matter what the world thinks, the, the Lord looks down and when he sees people who are upholding these standards of modesty without wrath and without doubting, he's pleased. He says, that is honoring to me, and I am pleased. And he will bless that person that is willing to go along with that and uphold God's standards and understand that being naked or being immodest is a very shameful thing and should not once be named among God's people. Let's go ahead and pray.